Hello. In 1978, I enrolled at East Coast Bible College in Charlotte, North Carolina. And one of the classes that I took that first semester was Church of God History and Polity. It required that I write a final paper, and I chose as the topic of my final paper the life and ministry of my great uncle, Earl P. Falk Sr. So I traveled back to Baxley, Georgia, where Uncle Earl was living in retirement, and we sat down for about an hour. I made this following recording, and uh, as he talked about various aspects of his life and ministry. Uh, I'm sorry that the uh, quality of the recording is poor. I want to appreciate the work of my son, Nathan, uh, in trying to make it a little better, but it was uh, originally recorded on an old cheap cassette tape. Uh, it was at least 25 years old before I had the digital file made, and so it had just uh, deteriorated. So this is the best we can do, but I hope you enjoy it. Okay, then in the early, just what started the Church of God in this area? Well, the man that uh, came down here really that got things going, Brother S.J. Heath. Heath? Yeah. And uh, he came down here and uh, ran Clint Beaton over Peter Cook and one of the four robins. And uh, moved a lot of people. They never heard him in the bathroom class and told him. And he was an outstanding minister. And I went to his tent meeting and was convicted. And uh, as a result of going to his tent meeting, why I got under conviction and got saved. And the very night I got saved, incidentally, uh, James Devin, what he is. And Sam Premier over there, and I got saved on Premier tonight. And that very night. That was 1921. That very night I'd done my ministry. Talked that night when I did it out. And then each time I'd go to prayer meeting in any place, they'd want me to talk some. And so I did it. So my time was well occupied over the weekend. And I'd be called different places. And from there I started my ministry. And, uh, I was still a member of the Free Baptist Church. When I got married to her, and uh, soon after I got married to her, why I prayed and asked God for direction. And if it was his will, I was going to meet him, Brother J.A. Hicks. I was going to meet him at Fort Auburn after Church of God dinner. And I, uh, didn't tell anybody, but I prayed and asked the Lord if it was His will for me to unite with the Church of God by to give an opportunity that night. It was in the, a week night. Well, ordinarily, they didn't give an opportunity for the And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, you know that everything, and it's your will for me to affiliate with the Church of God, make the preacher give an opportunity for the night. I thought I was making it hard on the Lord, but you don't make it hard. Mm -hmm. So we went and they had the uh, song service devotion and we went along. It's true why the preacher got to preach and I relieved my mind. I said, well, it's not the will of the Lord for me to delay the church of God tonight because he's not going to give an opportunity. So he got up there and read his scripture, announced his text, and he looked around and said, strange. He said, I feel strange. He said, for some reason, I feel like giving an opportunity to church membership tonight. <laughs> and I said, in my mind, I said, that's it. So he called him back around the organ and said, come back and give us another song. And you ain't had me was uh, the organist, and she went up playing her, her back was to, to me. He said, for some, I'm on a, I'm going to ask to sing one verse and somebody here would want to join the church. They may come. So the first, when they started singing, I got walked down there and joined the church. Now that happened in 1923. I was converted in 1921. This is 1923 when I joined the church of God. So when uh, they told, uh, I came down while the Spirit of the Lord fell and they began to shout. 
हमारा दुष्ट
a Christian spring music that I liked to make and put up an order and uh, preach. And besides, in one night I preached on holiness. And during that day I looked up 62 scriptures and put them down, wrote them down the chapter and verse on a piece of paper. And I thought that night I'd just get up there and read the scripture and comment, turn to the Bible and read it. But when I got up, and began my message by the first scripture just appeared I could see it very plain and clear so I quoted that told them what was found and quoted it verbatim and I thought uh, the next scripture I'd have to read but when I got through that scripture then I could see the next scripture when I got through that one I could see the next scripture and I got to preaching the 62 scriptures on holiness I had quoted all of them perfectly. And that was the Spirit of the Lord had to be. Because Jesus said in St. John 14, 26, said, But the comfort of which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to remember, what he said. So the Spirit of the Lord was in me and helped me. And from then on till today, why it's been true. I remember one time I preached the sermon on sound doctrine in North Carolina and the secretary is taken down and I use over 300, I use 300 scriptures on that, in that message. And I preached in the General Assembly once on the Godhead and I used over 300 scriptures. I didn't even open my Bible. See the God, the, the divine teacher, the divine, he that has a mastermind uh, the Bible talks about the mind of the spirit, that God knows what the mind of the spirit is. So he has a mastermind. He knew all the scriptures that had been uttered by the prophets and by Jesus and by the apostles. He knew them all. And so he came in as a person in my life without going, having an opportunity to go into college, which I wished I could have had an opportunity. Well, I saw God and read scripture day and night and acquainted myself. I uh, first started out, I read through the New Testament without stopping ten times. I read through the Old Testament twice so I could familiarize myself with the scriptures in general. So uh, then I began to move out. They wanted me to go out in evangelistic work. And I spent seven years in the evangelistic work all over the country. Finally, uh, they wanted me to go to Alabama to be state evangelist. I went to the state of Alabama and was there one year, worked in the state of was there, said, I want you next year to be our state evangelist and do all your work in Alabama, which I did. What year was this? Do you remember? No, I don't, I don't remember what year it could have been. Do you remember we had the... Uh, Earl Jr. was a baby and Murray was a baby. You know, when we went. It's been 50 years ago. The early 30s? Yeah. And uh, <coughs> then the next year, after I'd spent two years in Alabama, the general officials wanted me to become a general evangelist to go anywhere in the movement. And I spent about five years doing that, going in all of our prominent churches in the uh, movement. All of my prominent churches, I was in campaigns, north, south, west, and whatever I went. And at night, and when I was 26 years of age, they pointed me over to Michigan. And uh, I was there a year, and it was so cold up there, Adam's health was not good, and we came back down here, and I passed through the church at Almer a year. And in, at the net, end of that year, at the General Assembly, they appointed me overseer of South Carolina. And I was overseer there one year. Brother Thart was uh, the president of the uh, Bible School, called the Bible School then. And they wanted him to, uh, I mean, he was pastor at Greenville, and I was overseer of South Carolina. And they wanted him to become the president of the Bible school, and he wouldn't agree to uh, do that unless they'd relieve me from being.
being overseer of South Iron Cape and Green Church. So I did uh, relieve, they did relieve, and I accepted the Church of Greenville. The Lord helped me. When I went there, there was about 400 members. I, take, I took in uh, 400, near 500 members. In other words, when I left there, we had uh, about 900 and some members. Out. Let's talk about your pastor at Greenville. Just when you went there, talk about the ways that the Spirit led. I know you've talked to me about that big offering and the way the Lord opened the bank up on Sunday yeah. and just, you know, things like that. Well, I, I, I started to pastor and I felt I was not able to follow but the far. I felt my uh, inability, I felt. But the Lord is always the difference. He makes up the difference. So God began to move in a miraculous way and the church was soon uh, so full that we couldn't take any more. And I began to ask God to help us and uh, and uh, he did help us. And I built another church beside the one was there that called it just exactly the same side and made twin fronts and uh, went along and God was blessing us in such a marvelous grand way by uh, the Spirit of the Lord was falling in such a way and this church that I built just built and then later I put on 28 Sunday school rooms and then only been in there two weeks and caught on fire and burned up, burned down. And uh, that was when God helped me too. I didn't know what in the world when the uh, churches burned this little... I got over there at 2 o'clock in the morning and people began to gather around there about a thousand children that came to and i never forget that must have been two or three hundred children right around me. And the roof of that church fall, fell in and burned in. They screamed and fell on their knees and said, ask me where, where, where we're going, where would they go to Sunday school? And in the meantime, there's a great miracle happened. People cut to me that night and when I got to the house the next morning about nine o'clock, I had, I don't know, several thousand dollars been handed to me that night, several thousand, maybe ten, twelve thousand. People writing checks. I, I remember Mr. Charlie Daniel, who was one of the biggest builders. He was uh, one of the biggest builders in our nation, Mr. Daniel. And he came out there and he slipped a check in my pocket for twelve hundred dollars. And uh, when I got down to it, anyway, I told me that newspaper men was with me. So forth and so on. She said there's a, a call, there's a widow woman called and said, I promise her I'd send you over. And she had a little grandson, his name was Jimmy, called Little Jimmy. I had her early broadcast there every morning from 6 to 6 30. This little fellow is about eight, eight years old. He listened to my program every morning, put the alarm clock and listened to it. And this morning, when the time came for me to broadcast, the church was still burning. I went to, I had a studio in the church, and I couldn't go, it was burning down. I went to the radio station and greeted the people, and I told them a good morning. And I was a sad pastor, my church was burning down. So Jimmy jumped out of the bed and ran, and told his grandmother, Do you hear what Brother Falk said? He said, He'd already said, he was just eight years old. He wanted to be make a preacher like the Paul. And he said, "Yes, I, I heard it." And she said, "He said, grandmother, call him and come over here. I want to give my little piggy back to help him build the church back." So he and Adam had told me, and I left the newsman and went on over there. I never, she never, grandmother never had not been to see me, or, but she knew me because she'd seen the picture in the paper. And said, I know you, Brother Paul. And I said, yes. He said, little Jimmy wants to see you. I, she called him and he came. And he was dirty. looked like he hadn't had a bath in all oh, weeks. So rolls and holes in the knees. Hadn't been patched where he'd been down playing marble. And he came and put his arms around my neck. And I had to kneel down. 
said, I heard your church. Your church burned, yeah. And he said, I got a little piggyback. I'm going to give you to help me build a church. I didn't want to take it, but the Lord said, take it. Look at the house, and there's 46 pennies in it. Not a piece of white money. So, without my knowing, the two radio stations, I, they worked it up that they'd put me on both stations that night at 10 o'clock and let me tell the people about the church burning if anybody wanted to give an offer. They made arrangement with all the taxi cab companies. They had them lined up for three or four blocks in each direction. And late the evening, they called me and said, get to my members and friends to put in each taxi cab and I could tell the story, tell the people about church burn down if anybody would to give an offer. Call and we'd send the cab to pick it up. So the first thing I told, I told about little Jimmy. Those telephones begin to ring, I tell you it was something. And I went from 10 to 12 and I got over $10,000 cash that night. And the next evening I got a letter from the president of the steel company and he said, uh, Reverend Park, I heard you know about the church and regret so very much and I heard you tell a story of little Jimmy last night. He said, I want to give you a little check. Help. If he gave his piggy bank, I'm going to give you a check. So he gave the check for 5000 In other words, uh, J.P. Morgan was a member of uh, president's cabinet and he knew me. I'd met him and he gave me $58,000 on the Greenwood Church. But little Jimmy gave more than J.P. Morgan because I, people on the strength of what he did rallied to my support and it was just marvelous. That's one of the greatest things that I ever know about finance. And your ministry as far as being in Greenwood was really world nationwide. Oh yes. It was nationwide, and I had to clear, they had a clear channel station, WFBC, that reached, I got mail as far away as California, all this part of the country, especially the eastern part of the nation, covered even New York, it was a clear channel station, and it was, I had more radio time than anybody else. Or they said to anybody in the nation, I had uh, I was on each morning from six to six thirty. And you pioneered radio and television. Yeah, I sure did. And uh, I had uh, this daily program. And on Saturday night, each Saturday night, I was on from ten to twelve. And each Sunday afternoon, I was on from three to five. And uh, I broadcasted. And. About once a month, I'd have an all-night broadcast, all night long. People would call in. So I had the first outstanding radio program that was in the Church of God. And that program paid its way. Yeah. yeah that, that program paid its way. Always, if people sent in donations, and uh, I put copper on the floor out of that radio fund, and I bought a fine piano out of that radio fund, and it certainly was a help, and I had an opportunity during that time. A fellow came, uh, Norman W. Green, Greenway. He was a Ph.D., highly educated, and one of the finest speakers I ever heard, of, but didn't like Pentecost, and he came down to Anderson, 30 miles from Greenway put up his tabernacle and seat 4,000 people, got some radio time and began to fight Pentecost. He kept challenging anybody, he challenged anybody to meet him and, and he would defeat them on the doctrine of Pentecost. And so he kept on and made it so hard we couldn't get by without answering him some way or another. He got so far, he said he'd like to have the head of uh, Church of God, Assembly of God, and Pentecostal Holiness, three Pentecostal movement, to have a, each, each one to have a man that he'd meet him and so forth and so on. So I, we talked, and they didn't think, of course, it was a wise thing for three men to get go against him. 
you want to you do that with the psychology of the thing, strategy. So I rolled up a contract and went down one day and, uh, and he came off of the air. Came out and I said, uh, I'm Earl P. Park, you don't know me. One of the names said, yeah, I know the name. I said, you've been talking about wanting to debate. Now then I want you to put your signature where you've been using your mouth, put your signature to this contract. And he accepted it and was going to have a, a debate in uh, his time like a seat of 4,000 people. And uh, he said, I'll furnish the tabernacle and you pay for the radio time. You want to broadcast this? I said, that's wonderful. So we was to debate. I was to have the first hour and then the second hour and then 30 minutes each and then five minutes each. So I, I'd heard him. I'd uh, been sitting listening to him attack Pentecost and I knew his thoughts. So I, and that day the newspaper said there's 12,000 people there. There's more, far more people outside than the owner in the tabernacle seated four thousand. And uh, newspaper men were there. So the good Lord helped me. When I had the first hour in, before I'd ended the first hour, I saw I had it whipped. Because he didn't know what in the world he was going to do. Because I'd used all the scriptures and points that he had used, and I'd tore them all to pieces and proved to the people Beyond any doubt that he contradicted himself. The Bible said, Study to show thyself approved unto God of work, and need not shame right the divine word of truth. But I told the people any doctrine or any theory that was put forth that wouldn't harmonize with the Bible in its entirety is not right, because God would be sensible enough not to contradict himself, no matter knowing how. And so when we got through that afternoon, we had won the victory overwhelming. The people stood by a hundred trying to get to me. When I got away from there, I had uh, about five or six times enough to pay the radio time, no more than that. I had every pocket I had full of money. And from that time on, it's when Pentecost began to pick up in that country called Greenway with an outstanding scholar. And uh, the next Wednesday night, after we had debate on Sunday. My assistant pastor, Brother Elder McIntyre, and myself went over there. We got through a prayer meeting early, and he had always beaten late. We went over there the next Wednesday night and counted the people where he had been having the tabernacle full every night, 4,000. The next Wednesday night, after we had the debate, he only had 25 people. <laughs> you embarrassed him. Yeah, and uh, that's, that's the way that things went. And, uh, well, God helped us. I, uh, remember I had a mission program there in Greenville. Put the men against the women. You get a thousand dollars then, it was something. So, uh, put the men against the women. I put two big tubs down. I didn't use my collection plates, but number one tub uh, in each aisle, let them put in there. When I got through, I had $4,000. That was a big offer in those days for mission. So things like that happened. And, no. So I, I took, I had an opportunity to praise the trail. The first uh, big offer was ever taken for the AIDS ministers was while I was in Greek. We had AIDS ministers. And, I had the opportunity of being on the committee that brought in the recommendation of the General Assembly to have an AIDS Minister's Fund. Brother Tharp and Brother Frank Lemons and myself as a committee brought in the recommendation. And we started an AIDS Minister's Fund. And I uh, had old brother J.B. Ellis to come. He was blind. He lost his eyesight. He was a great preacher. And he preached one Sunday morning. And that, after that, I told him he was going to ask for an offering start an age ministers fund the church of God. The people gave four hundred dollars. That was a big offering then it started and so now we've got a fund that amounts to more than a million I guess. More than that. And all begun with uh, our recommendation and my first effort put forth for it. 
Uh, about your radio program, what was the name of your church radio program? Just uh, uh, Church of God from Greenwood, South, South Carolina, to say good morning, good evening, good evening. Everyone to pray the name of Jesus. This is Church of God in Greenwood, South Carolina. I am a people pastor. Okay, after your pastor in Greenwood, where'd you go from there? I did appointed Mr. Steve Rosier. They appointed Mr. Steve Rosier this day. Georgia, Georgia. And I stayed here a year, and then they appointed me to was here in North Carolina. They moved me to North Carolina. I stayed there uh, two two years, and they elected me as the Sister General was there. All right. Now, then what? Well, I was reading in the minutes. So then, did they just have one assistant instead of three? Yeah. yeah, they had one assistant who was uh, the General was there at that time was uh, Brother J. H. Walker, and his assistant was R. P. Johnson. And then they went to the seminary and elected me as the second assistant. I was the second assistant. The first assistant, General was R. P. Johnson, and I was the uh, second one. And I happen to have the honor of being the man that I had served out my time, and each general official served out time, but never would be reelected. I served a time out, and was the first man to be reelected back, uh, back in the office of General Sims office. I had that distinct honor. Now, since then, though, Brother Horton has been reelected. He served as General Sims reelected. So has Brother Hughes. Yeah, so has Brother Hughes now. But you were the first. I was the first to have that experience. Okay, when you were, as an official in the Church of God, a lot of things happened, like you, the, you were on the committee that created the Declaration of Faith. Well, what happened, we had a, a difference among the brethren about sanctification. They, uh, we believe in the sanctification as subsequent to regeneration. We always talk that. But they talked about it being a second definite work, which is all right. But some of the men said that you had to have a second definite Work of sanctification takes sin out of your heart. That when you're regenerated, the sin, the principle is the sin, the inherited sin remain in the heart, which was not according to Scripture. And uh, of course, I take, took issue with that. I told them I believed in uh, regeneration or being born again, and then an experience sanctification, and then the experience of being filled with, baptized in the Holy Ghost, and being filled with the Spirit. And it became a great issue. The church was divided, and they called, asked me to preach in the General Assembly, and I preached it that way. That was, that was in Columbus, Ohio, we had the General Assembly. I preached it that way, and it became such issues about the split of church. So uh, we had it up in the General Assembly, about three or four assemblies, and it was getting worse and worse. And finally, they appointed a committee seven men. I had to be one of those. And uh, we met while the same was going on, spent one whole night in the hotel. And the next morning we brought out what we have now as a declaration of faith. It's never been, uh, they tried to uh, add to it or take from it, but it failed and it stands just now like it was in God kept us. That's what brought peace because uh, they, they gave up that idea about having to have an experience to take sin out. All the sin, inherited sin and practical sin, is forgiven when you're born again. You become a new creature. Old things pass away, and behold, all things are made new. And Ephesians 2, 24, Paul said, And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, a thing doesn't exist before it. I mean, before it's created, it doesn't exist. And he's talking about the first experience, the new birth, or the, or the experience of justification or regeneration. And that man is created in righteousness, true holiness, true holiness. You don't have anything until you get that experience. And when you get that experience, then all sin, practical sin, inherited sin goes out. All things are made new. You become a new creature. And but then we needed an experience.
experience of sanctification so that the will of man can be sanctified the will of God. Torch chapter Roman, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, whole and acceptable unto God. You, uh, you can't walk in the light, you get in the light. But when you're regenerated, you see, and when a person is born again, they're out of sin and business. Third chapter, first John the ninth verse said, Who shall is born of God? He has not commit sins, receiving men of any. Cannot sin because he's born of God. But his he, he's left a natural man with a natural appetite. So he walks in light and goes and presents himself, put himself on the altar. Say, God, here am I, I want you to sanctify me holy. L B H O L L Y holy, which is entirely completely sanctify my appetite, sanctify my body, accept it in it. It is a definite experience. But it's not to take away sin, it's to keep one from sinning mm -hmm. and uh, to walk in the light. And that was a great argument. So the declaration of faith speaks for itself. And I was on that. The two men that was more prominent in that was Brother E.M. Ellis and myself. He was a great man. Were there any, uh, in that meeting of you and this, uh, six or seven men, seven men, were there any, uh, debates, oh, yeah. splits during that meeting? Well, we went over scriptures all that night, and we work on this one until we get through the agree, and then next and on, and all, we considered everything. And then late in the night, we begin to write, and we wrote up uh, the Declaration of Faith. As it is, it's never been amended. They, they uh, offered the men met the General Assembly, and it fell through and was defeated. What amendment was that? Amendment? Well, they wanted to amend uh, the terminology of the word in of itself. Oh. That's all. Not the principle. Not the doctrine. No. Okay. So uh, that was an, an outstanding time, but the Lord helped us. And, and now you take that brother E.M. Ellis. I didn't know it. But we were great friends, though we differed in opinions on that. And when he died, he died with a heart attack, this vet called me. He said, Brother Paul, Dad's gone. And I said, no. Yes, and said, uh, Mother tells us that he had told her that when he died, that he wanted early pearly, he called me early pearly. He wanted early pearly to preach his funeral, I did. I went to preach the funeral which I felt was one of the greatest honors in all of my life, was just a feeling of a great man like Ian Ellis. But the Lord helped us, and we came together on this Declaration of Faith. He agreed to it, and so did I. And everybody else could agree to it. And they say the church was split. Were there any definite changes in practical commitments and the teachings, like tobacco and wedding band and so forth? <laughs> now, it's the church has always stood one time the church stood against people uh, couldn't work in it. Tobacco? Yeah. Couldn't work in it, couldn't grow it. And I went to Genesis and I saw Brother A. Lee Bobby was there was there of Georgia and we made a survey. And 95% of our members in the state of Georgia didn't have their own homes. They rented land. And they could not rent land unless they'd agreed to grow tobacco. That was a must. And so they just turned out the men that had large families and just had it. It's a money crop. They had to grow it. There's no choice. And so they began to turn them out. And so I went to the General Assembly and told them that was unreasonable and unthinkable. That, uh, you remember, 19th chapter of Matthew, that David, when he had fought a battle, he went after they had fought the battle, went in the house of God and ate the showbread which is only for the priest to eat and for not soldiers. But Jesus Christ said he ate the bread but was blameless because of the circumstances. Right. And so I told him it's the same thing. So I, I uh, made a move there that uh, we stand forever against the use of tobacco in any shape, form, or fashion. But those that had to do it, why they became able to do so and so we could pass. That, that was changed. And when I first came to church, you couldn't wear a wedding band. And I felt that, though I remember World War I, I felt like that uh, our women folks especially 
should have the privilege of wearing a ring, not for decoration, but for what it stood for. And so we, I went to the same with that movement, and it took me two years. Through the second year we brought up, we passed it to where they could wear a ring. What all happened in that? I've heard that it almost caused us another split. Yeah, it almost caused another split. But the Lord helped us, and uh, finally it was passed. It became agreeable. I, I, I regret to say that some people are taking advantage of it. Going too far, I personally think, using unnecessary material for decoration. I would think it's right, personally. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's all right for the word wedding day. Represents. You remember that when the prodigal son came home, I did. he said, I'm not worthy to be called a son, make me one of the servants. And he said, bring the ring, put on his hand. It represented eternal love, endless love. And so the wedding band represents. I stood for our women to wear it because it, uh, they represented marriage. Sacred. And I still think that's all right. But it did. It was about as powerful as the question of sanctification. Who were the main men? I know Brother Hans, you know, was uh, Hughes and Horton. Well, well, Brother Horton was against the wet band. And Brother Hughes was on the side. I, I guess I spoke as much more than Brother Hughes and more. We were for it, and Brother Horton, I respect him greatly and love him, and, but he stood against it, but they lost the beat. Uh, were there any other you know, significant things in the church that happened mission-wise, Sunday school-wise, youth-wise, while you were an official that you, know, you were influential in? Well, I uh, had the honor of being the first youth, general youth director. We never put in the record. But the general was here said, we're going to appoint you as a representative of youth. I preached the first youth message in the General Assembly uh, to the youth and used Ephesians uh, 6 and 10. Be strong in the Lord and power of might in my text. And I preached the first youth message ever preached in the General Assembly. Do you remember what assembly that was? No. Way back Before the Declaration of Faith? Yeah. It was one of the first assemblies you were in. Oh, a few. There's been a few assemblies, but it's way back out in the open. Let's turn this off so we can get our heads together. It's run out. It's not, it wasn't voted out. Uh, then uh, I, I was still was there first in Tennessee, four years. And then I uh, went to Kentucky and stayed. One of the Kentucky was out there one year or two. One? Or maybe so. I was in Kentucky. Yeah. I I became, after I served my time as a general official, then they appointed me overseer of Tennessee, and then, and then Kentucky. Anything significant happened while you were Well, I, so many. Then so many wonderful things I don't call it to uh, Which one no, which town was it that you got that letter from President Kennedy? Oh, Tennessee. Tennessee. Uh, I, I can state that. I uh, you see, uh, I went to Jimmy Burns, Secretary of State. He wanted to know uh, he called me along with it. He wanted to know who I was gonna support or who could I support the Democratic Convention was coming up, and I, he wanted to know who I felt kind of torn. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I feel kind of toward Lyndon Johnson. The truth is, I'm, I'm going to put him there, but I'm afraid of Kennedy because he's a Catholic. I'm afraid of I might use undue power in that direction. And so Jimmy said, I am uh, the same. And will you go tell Lyndon Johnson that? I said, I can't. Lyndon Johnson was the uh, majority leader of the Senate at that time. And he wanted me to go tell him in person. I said, I can't see him. He said, all I want to know is you go. 
if I make it for him, I said, yeah. So he asked me, I was uh, still assistant general was there. He said, would you be in this telephone? I said, yeah. And uh, he said, you stay right there. So, and nobody little called back and said, you see him Thursday at 9 o'clock. <laughs> so I went and uh, I know Kennedy must have known that. He must have got the word. For all right, the Democratic Convention came and Kennedy was nominated to have Lyndon Johnson. So uh, went on and he, he was elected. Well, in the meantime, I had the assembly come and they appointed me to stay over here in Tennessee. And I came back, I went out, came in the office, had three secretaries and the girl was just giggling, excited. And I could tell, I said, what in the world happened? Why are you girls carrying on? said, if you knew what we knew, you'd be excited. I said, what do you know that I don't know? They said, you've got a personal letter to pay. And so I did. So he wrote me and said, I want you to come to my breakfast. She prayed that I breakfast and invites people. I've been to them. I've been to Eisenhower. But he wrote me. And I went. And he said, I'm inviting two ministers, Billy Graham and yourself. And I had an interview with the former King of England, you know. Yeah. Uh, King Edward VIII. They, and he gave up the throne they appointed governor of Bahamas. And I went down there and carried some documents and letters and recommendations from five men and sent them to him and told him I'd like to see him beyond the scene. And he gave me an appointment and I talked to him out there. Got to testify about the in a cause, I tell you, that's something that would be of interest. Uh, everything you said, I don't know, it amazes me, it really does, because it seems like that all the nation's political men were aware of you because of your influence. Yeah, they were. Now you take, uh, now like Jim Roberts, secretary, I don't mean after, but while he's secretary of the state, yeah. he was a dear friend of mine, bosom friend. As a matter of fact, I was passing in Greenville, and you know his home is Spartanburg, 30 miles above. And the newspaper would tell when Jimmy Burton came home. So I saw the headlines that he's going to be at home this weekend. So I knew that he had a secretary that he had off. So I called and told her that to who I was, and I'd like to speak to the Secretary of State, and he came in and hadn't called me. And he called. He got there, he called me. He called the bishop. He said, Bishop? So glad you called. I said, well, I'm calling you and wondering if you'd honor us by coming over to church here this weekend. He said, I, I was wondering if he was ever going to ask me. He said, I've been waiting long. So I got on the air that night, that was Saturday morning, and I had that two hours, and I told that thing that Jim O'Brien, you be with the church, my Lord. That church I've had 3,000 people in. They couldn't get no, it's about as many outside and inside when she came with them. So he came, brought his wife. And uh, came on in, the ushers piling in. And uh, he wanted to sit down back there. I said, no, come on up here. And uh, he seated his wife and he came on up and sat there with me. And the Spirit of the Lord really came down that morning. And I'll tell you, it was wonderful. The office was never played better, and the choir 300 never sang better. And after we had had prayer, he sat close to me and he touched me on the shoulder, whispered, and he said, Bishop, can you tell me what's different in this church? He said, there's something different here that I never felt in any other church. Never mind. And what is it? I said, I said, well, I said, Mr. Secretary, I said, it's in school of the Lord, and we'll take a call. He said, well, I know there's a difference. And the Lord come down, and uh, a lady in the quietness of service spoke, and his message gave, given, and it was his father. So he thoroughly enjoyed it. And then on, if he could come, he would. I didn't have to invite him, and he called me and talked to me from Washington. Okay. You've been to two presidential breakfasts, Eisenhower yeah. and Kennedy. Okay. Interviewed former King of England. Right. 
friend of Jimmy Burns. Friend of Jimmy Burns, he attended my church when he came. And, and, the, and Senator Thurman but came regularly to my church when he, he went out to the regular and he taught my men Bible class many times. And you're presently a friend of Herman Talmadge. Oh, yeah. Very close. Mm -hmm. I can call him anytime I want. Well, I can do that with Dick Russell. Now, he was a great man, Dick Russell. He was very close to me. He wouldn't let me call him anything but Dick. I had him to get a boy out of the Navy in two hours. <laughs> That's absolutely. You know what he was in? Uh, Dick, you know, was head of the Navy one time. And I called. We had a lady that had one son. On the he, she belonged to That's had one son. He's in the Navy. He, he was in the Navy. And they wanted him to get out of the hardship of his charge. Brother Thorpe was general saying he tried to cook. He said, I, I don't know, but one person might help you, Brother Paul might help you. He said, You might you know Dick Russell, he's senator and head of the Navy. So they contacted me and I got the, all the information. And I called him, I have a hotline, so to speak, to him. He said, You go to the secretary and my friend said, Listen, when the Reverend, what he called me Earl. I called him you. He said, When Earl called, he didn't know what I'm doing. I said, Put him in, put him on. Um, so the, I uh, called. So I'd speak. This is Earl Paul. And I'd like to speak to Dick Russell. So he said, "Hello, Earl." Uh, we exchanged salutation. He said, uh, "What do you need?" I told him the story. He said, "Are you convinced beyond any doubt that?" It's on the level, and it, uh, this is an honorable request. I said, I know it, I wouldn't call you. Okay. In two hours' time, he's out of an honorable district. <laughs> I've been able to get anything I want. I've got things that I can't tell things done. Okay. Then of all the people you knew, if you could have used it, you could have been, you could have used your, all your influence very politically. To do anything you wanted to do. Yes, well, they tried to get me here to run for Congress. Tried to get me run for what was run for grandfather. Representative? Oh, oh man, what that? politicians that were high men, they knew that your influence and they wanted to use it. Yeah, that's right. But you never would let them use it as no, far sir. as power. Well, I've checked you back. Yeah. 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 Well, I've had a lot of guys tell me 
that if I wanted to ever do anything, that I'd, I'd have to hang around you. I told him I couldn't do that. <laughs> well, the Lord has been great. Now, you just think I came from these. Right here. Right here. That's right. And I've traveled the whole world. Just a few nation land, very few. But I've uh, traveled the whole world, and I've known President King. So far, been able to get it. For instance, uh, you didn't know about it, but you're too young. And I know you've heard me talk about Bill Acock. Yeah. He sent us to the electric chair. And I went the day before this to the executive and talked to the governor. And he said, Tomorrow morning, the headline to read it was like the sentence of community for life. And he said, You can get it now. He said, I'll. I'll uh, not let him be executed, you can get him out. And I did. I, I let him serve a little time and I went for the board, party board, let him out because he didn't kill the woman. I've heard a lot of people talk about that. I know what happened. He took me, she took me in front of his wife kid. She, well, I couldn't tell her about that. But the same week she did it. She called it out there and told me, she said, I killed that woman. I said, I don't want to. I said, you're going to. Ed Cadals was against Bill, and I knew they had him executed. I said, you're going to, he said, no, I want him, she had a plan. He said, I want him sentenced to the chair. He said, I know you'd save him in the chair. And she said, they did it. I went to Ed River, his governor, I told him the story. He said, do you know what, what it, and she killed him, she called him and told him. He said, I, I killed her, I told me. I said, did it? Just put the gun died. So when I went through with them, I said, he didn't do it. And he called her in his wife. And she he talked to her at the separate part of him. He said, I'm very good. So the next morning, headline. So she screamed out at the court. They uh, made him take her out. And the trial was going on. Yeah, I heard somebody say that. Yeah. He, said, he said, why do you persecute him? He didn't do it. I did. But a thing like that. No one she just trying to say Well, there's it. only one court of law can be tried for a crime. Right. That's a woman. And Bill was being tried. But I did go with the governor got in party. Then I went to the uh, pardoning board and they wanted to put me off. And I happened to know of one member of the board had received $6,000. I knew <laughs> paid. So that knife up here. <laughs> uh, he uh, is a person that wanted to do, and they paid one member of the board, of that part of the board, $6,000. I knew it. I went there and he told me to go out, and I come back and said, We decided to cut I said, Okay. Then if you want to play that game, I'll tell you what I know and I'm going to do. I said, I'm not going to point out the person I but I said, there's a person sitting right here that received $6,000 to do something. And I said, that person did it. And I can prove that they got the money. I said, just, just go play the game. We'll play it. I said, go out and go play it. <laughs> and when I came back, and said, we decided, we decided to party. Prophecy, yeah. Prophecy. Yeah. 
Did you see that when uh, Begin and Sadat hugged each other? Yeah, I saw it. Well, that thing made me shout. Yeah. Well, after having served as one of the general officials for several years and I'm trying to fulfill law limitation, I got me, which incidentally, way back down there, that was my motion that we have a law of limitation. And that man could serve so many years as general, so then he had to be replaced. So, uh, after I filled my time, one of the other men who was sitting in the chair where I once sat, they part of the state over here of Tennessee. I was there for four years, and incidentally, while I was there is when I got the letter from the president, President Kennedy, and had the honor of having breakfast with him, Peter Green and myself. Oh, nice. And uh, then when I got to my four years at Tennessee, they appointed me to Kentucky, and I served there two years and resigned, and came back and passed the church at Macon uh, two years, I believe. Then I decided I want to go out and, and do some more evangelistic work. I had a long and to do, I enjoyed evangelistic work. So I went in evangelistic work and worked for four or four years, going here and there everywhere, doing uh, evangelistic work. So I've come down now to uh, pastor here at Baxley, associate pastor at but Arnett's pastor now, and I'm enjoying it. I teach Sunday school class and visit the sick and uh, working from where I first begun. I live right now. I passed in Zion two years before I went to Van to work. But incidentally, I'm back to where I first came. Right here at this spot is a little old house where they're having prayer meetings. Way back down at 57 years ago. I came over here and uh, got acquainted with the United Man. Walked down this road down down here, the next house to where Henry lives now. And uh, that was my first week with her. It was three months and 20 days from the first night. I went with her from Permian down there while we were married. So I thought so much of the place, I just bought this place. Would you consider that, you're talking about this little house out yeah. here? Yeah. Would you consider that the first Church of God in South Georgia? No, it wasn't, it wasn't the first, but uh, Zion, that's where Zion was worshiping. That church had burned down. That's one of the times the church had burned down. Well, what I'm saying, that right there is the offspring. Yeah. That was the first Church of God meeting. Yeah. And yeah. South Georgia was held there. Well, uh, to be exact about it, they'd organized the church at Poor Robin and then Zion. Where's Poor Robin at? Where it's up the road. Okay. It's uh, what? Carter's Chapel. Carter's Chapel of Paul Robin. Mm -hmm. It's the Church of God of Prophecy now. Oh, yeah. when they split, they must have. Yeah. So uh, we uh, we have this church here, and then I organized these other churches. Ephesus and Henry mm -hmm. and They organized the others. So, uh, so I guess I'll be here till Jesus comes, or I have to go. Uh, from right at the spot. I came back to the place I started. I went to all parts of the world. 